One of the most nervous aspects of the cast coming together was the fact that they'd never met each other before. That, you know, we'd gone around the world and we'd picked the best people for each of the roles individually. Met them, auditioned them, whatever, offered them the role, they'd accepted the role. We were happy. But the unknown thing was that none of them had worked together before. None of them, most of them had never even met each other before. So there was a very nervous moment when, when suddenly we're in New Zealand six weeks out from the shoot and everybody starts getting off the plane. When, when I was getting ready to go out, they said, when you get to Heathrow, uh, you'll be, you'll be travelling with someone called Orlando Bloom. I just left my, my family behind and my friends and my life and I was like feeling a little bit teary, teary you know, at the idea of, uh, of leaving everything behind and my dog and everything. And, um... and I see this guy, you know, and I thought, he looks elf-like. And uh, this wee fella walked over and he said, You wouldn't be Orlando Bloom, would you? He said, Billy! And I was like, uh, oh my God, you're a hobbit. And we just had this huge embrace. And it was my birthday as well. I'd just turned 30 that day. So we had champagne on the flight. And then when we got to LA, because of the time difference, it was my birthday again. So we had more champagne, you know, because it's the 28th again. Pete had done something very uh, intelligent, whereby at the start of filming, it was the full hobbits for about two months primarily, just as no one else. And I really hoped that those four guys would bond, because one, it would make the 15 months go a lot quicker if everybody was friendly and got, got along. But also, for the film, I knew that, you know, having the hobbits sort of feeling like they really were connecting was something that, that was important for the movie. So I, I didn't know anyone, and there's always that fear of going to a new place in uncharted territory. I was there for the best part of a year. So it was my life for a year, totally, away from home, uh, just making new friends. It's such an adventure, you don't know who anyone is, everybody's trying to find their feet and, and, and to react and, and try and be sociable. Um, and that was one of the great things that these friendships formed with the unlikeliest of people. It was a real kind of boy scout kind of, uh, you know, year and a half. It was men together. I mean, you know, you, every so often Liv would be there and Kate Blanchett would be there, which was such an amazing thing because you've got these two gorgeous women who got so much attention from us guys because, you know, we adored them so much. Well, I remember being really nervous because I felt like a lot of the emphasis, because it was all the boys, was on them meeting me in a way, and I was so nervous to meet them. And when I think about how I saw them, it's completely different to how I see them now, but they're all so cute. And it was this amazing kind of coming together. Here we are, we're all finally here, we're almost all of us, and, and we're gonna set out on this journey. And uh, it was this incredible excitement and anticipation for what we were about to do together. One of the amazing things about Elijah, I think, is he, he can sleep anywhere at any time. I mean, I've seen him do it. And, like, if they don't go back to him for, like, 15 minutes, he'll just be sitting there like that, like, for 15 minutes. And then someone will go, Elijah, yeah, yep, seen, right. And he goes, it's, a, it's an incredible thing that he's got. I mean, he must have been so tired during that shoot because, you know, there was times when we had time off. Elijah pretty much had no time off, ever. I've seen him fall down three sets of staircases, like, and then just get up and go, and just walk up. And he's, that is a, an incredible gift, man. He's like, you know, like Chaplin. I sort of appointed myself as his kind of minder. You know, I wanted to look after him and make sure that he was okay. Sean was very much Sam for me, you know, always looking after me, being there for me. He kept locking his keys in his apartment, and he'd leave and he couldn't get back in. And I was like, well, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And I would arrange, you know, uh, to have a locksmith brought out there and, and, you know, get his keys. And so he could continue going about having whatever fun he was having, you know, or talking to who he was talking to, and, and 45 minutes later, I bring him his keys, and Elijah, here's your keys. And he was like, oh, wow, great, thanks, you know, thanks for taking care of it. I saw the need for life to imitate art. Sam needed to look after Frodo as his sort of primary identity. Uh, as the fellowship started to coalesce, that's how, that was the job I carved out for myself. Sean Aston is just a, a, a very cool man. He's, he, he had a different experience than the rest of his hobbits because he's got a family, of course. He was there with his wife, Christine, and, and, and his beautiful daughter, Ali, who we were all uncles to her at the end, you know. Sean is a very kind of 
untrusting individual when it comes to safety. He's going to hate me for saying this, but it's true. Uh, he, he always had to check out everybody else's job and make sure that they were doing their job properly because he didn't necessarily trust that they had it all under control. And there was one such instance when we were in a helicopter and we were in a kind of uh, treacherous mountain area. It wasn't easy to land and it wasn't easy to take off. Elijah, Billy and I were just having so much fun because we were in helicopters and we were saying to the guy, could you, you know, could you try and flip over or could you do some banks or, you know, could you, how close could you get to that mountain? And, you know, if we put a bike down, could you pick it up by its wheels and all that kind of stuff? And they're talking and laughing and scratching and I can see that like all three helicopters are making their way in and ours is the first one to go or second one to go. And I'm like, you guys shut up. They're talking. They're like, Sean, and they know what they're doing. They're safe. And I'm like, oh man, this is not good. And Sean immediately starts like drilling the, the pilot of the helicopter. Like, all right, do, do you know, you know, that you've got like two guys behind you waiting to come in. Do you know, are you cool to like take off and asking him all of these kind of safety questions that I'm sure this pilot had completely under control. And there was also a point where um, Elijah and I and Billy and Sean had been dropped off at lower altitude. And we were there for about half an hour waiting for a helicopter to pick us up. And we were throwing stones at trees and running around and you know, having fun. And Sean was about 100 yards away from us and he was directing helicopters into land. <laughs> you see, you see, you got two behind you. Hey, Bon. Come on in. You know, waving to the helicopter guy, you know, to pointing out where the other guys were in there, waving me in the hobbits were all making fun of me because I was, like, trying to be Mr., you know, involved. Billy Boy's a unique uh, guy. Uh, I'm so uh, just blessed to have met him, you know? Dom's an idiot. <laughs> no, Dom's great. Um, we were probably, I was probably closest with Dom because, you know, we had so much stuff together. Done and done. I was involved in, in, in a close uh, near-death experience, really. It was, it was kind of traumatic. We were filming the scene where the, the hobbits run to the... Uh, Brandywine Bridge and get on the ferry. We were rehearsing, running very fast, as fast as we could down this wooden bridge uh, and then jumping onto the ferry. And then in one of the times, as we ran down to get to the ferry, Dom got a wooden splinter through his, through his foot. An amazingly tough splinter, I think probably made of titanium. You think somebody had cut his leg off? It was, it was, the sweat was pouring off him. You know, like, every time I put pressure on my foot, it was just an excruciating uh, pain, like, going up my foot. I thought he was going to pass out at one point, and, it, and everybody thought it was something really, really kind of serious. And I was saying to all the boys, I was saying to Elijah and Sean and Billy, I said, you've got to come over and see them take this splinter out, because it's going to be a whop. You know? It's going to be, like, this big, and I'm, and I'm going to get it framed. And they take out this tiny splinter, and I was like, I cannot believe you made that fuss over that splinter. I kept it, I kept the splinter, still got it. <laughs> so uh, after that, whenever, like, Dom did something, he'd start sweating, it. if anything happened, I'd is it a splinter, is it, are you OK? And he'd be like... Rrr. We had a hiccup in the casting process because another actor had been cast in the role of Aragorn, and we just came to a realisation that we had cast the role a little too young. It caused us a lot of headaches because we were now shooting the film, we couldn't stop shooting it, and we only had a very limited number of days that we could shoot without the character of Aragorn. And I got a phone call at home um, saying, do you want to get on a plane tomorrow to go to New Zealand? And I said, for what? And then they said, you know, the Lord of the Rings. I knew that this was a very, very important conversation, that he'd never met me before. He didn't know who I was. I'd never met him. He'd never been to New Zealand before. He hadn't read the Lord, Lord of the Rings. I just said, well, can I think about it for a minute? He said, well, not very long, you know, but you have till this afternoon. And then we somehow had to try to persuade him um, to take this role because we thought he would be really great and we badly wanted him now in this movie, you know. We, we, I mean, we were in a real bind. And I hung up the phone and, and my son was, was with me there. 
He says, what was that about? Was that Lord of the Rings? I said, yeah, they're making a movie out of it. And, and he knew the story. You know, I didn't. And I know that uh, the person we really have, have to thank for um, persuading Vigo was his son, Henry. Because Henry was about, um, I think he was about 11 or 12 years old at that time, and he was a huge fan of The Lord of the Rings and absolutely was was beside himself when he thought that his dad could get to play Aragorn. So it was nice to have his blessing, you know what I mean? Most times that you're with Vigo, something amazing is not too far behind. He's like an old-fashioned movie star in my eyes, you know, very gentlemanly and very polite and, uh, you know, very concentrated in his art. You know, in, in a word, I would, I would say, I would describe Vigo as, as being very inspiring. Being a, a, the natural leader of this group of actors in the Fellowship, uh, came very easily to him. Well, he was always doing things like, you know, like he'd, he'd get all the keer and, you know, I'm pretend to throw him over the edge of the mountain. <laughs> well, you can see the wildness in his eyes. He goes slightly mental. Something kind of clicks. And then he just rugby tackled me for some reason, you know, really, like, bang! Go, oh, that's I wondered what would hit me, you know, and I was, you know, like, <laughs> He's an extraordinary guy, really. I mean, he believes in the truth in everything he does, I think, you know, no matter what it is. And if he doesn't, uh, he doesn't do it. He's an incredible artist in so many different forms. Photography and painting and poetry, and he, he just lives for the moment, it seems. He lives for, for life. Vigo is an incredible photographer, and he took a lot of photographs throughout the whole time. And, you know, you sit at your little makeup station and there's a mirror in front of you, and he just from the beginning day one started to you know make a collage all around the outsides of the mirror and by the end of the shoot there was no mirror left they were overlapping it was full of pictures and then it became another layer and another layer it's all the way up on the ceiling and wrapping around behind and trickling onto our mirrors and he he was thinking of like you know buying the bus and taking it with him because it was such a brilliant collage of memories and moments he doesn't just act the character. He he has to somehow become part of the character. He and the character have to have to blend. And Vigo, I think, saw his sword as being the key into his character. And as a result, he didn't really want to go anywhere without a sword. Um, I know there were restaurants he'd go and eat in at the end of a day shooting where he'd carry his sword and he'd put it by the table as he as he was eating he wouldn't drive anywhere in his car without the sword being in the back seat that was on the way out of a you know sunday rehearsal when i was walking out of the gym all sort of sweaty of half in street clothes and half in airborne clothes you know waving the sword around trying to keep a mental picture of what we'd just done sort of i guess walking down the street down to where my car was parked on a sunday afternoon <laughs> waving the sword around and looking like, you know, the sort of desperate Rasputin character to them, probably. <laughs> Cop cars conversed on me, there'd been some report. The interesting mix that John put on the thing was that he's not a big fan of rehearsing too much uh, for fight scenes. Uh, and his method would be to say to the stunt guys, how many of you are coming towards me? And they'd say, six. And he'd say, okay, who's first? And, they'd say, and the guy would go, um, I'm first. And he'd go, okay, you come at me and I'll hit you with my axe, and then you come and I'll hit you and you come. And, I, and he would just take these guys out. And the stunt guys would, you know, tough guys, big tough guys, they'd wear a lot of armor. And they'd say, OK, John, you know, uh, you know try, try and miss us, but if you do hit us, it's not a problem, we don't mind. He would hit every single one of them. Someone would come at him and he'd just bang, bang, boom. And uh, the stuff that they got of John fighting is uh, brilliant because it's real. You know, the stunt guys are absolutely terrifying. <laughs> They're just running away from this guy. As you can see, the shots that you're getting are incredible. You know, he just looks on fire, but that is because... John was wearing a prosthetic that limited his vision to this because he had, you know, prosthetic skin and his eyes were swollen because he was allergic to the prosthetic, so they were slightly shut. And he, he, he had no kind of, you know, uh, sideway vision. I mean, at, at times you just wanted to rip the damn stuff off and just scratch. Added to which I developed this topical eczema, which meant that basically every time the, the upper and lower eyelids were attached, I, I lost all the skin in, in, in this area. It was like a skin peel. And within hours then it would swell and it would turn sort of lobster pink. 
and then you know it, it would just be covered with lymph and it was itchy and painful and one felt very very self-conscious john reese davies took us to a restaurant and uh, it was when we'd, we'd only just started to get to know John. And uh, we sat down at this huge long table and he, and he said, um, I think I will order the uh, food for tonight. And we said, oh, OK, on you go, John, you know. And we were all having a conversation and the waitress came over. And John ordered, you know, food that would probably have fed maybe 35, 40 people. And there were about 12 of us, you know. He just said, we'll have nine lobster and 15 shrimp and 12 red snapper, 15 filet mignons and some grilled mushrooms. I'll have 12 onions and uh, wild boar and, you know, all this kind of stuff, just like pheasants and grouse. And Do you have partridge? Bring the partridge, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, the, the brilliant thing about John is that because he's worked with so many amazing people and, and you know, worked on some great jobs, all you need to do is give him the merest hint that you would like to hear something about a job that he'd done, and he's off. One of the training regimes that we set up for our, our actors when they first arrived in New Zealand was, was boat handling skills, and I think that most of their training revolved around trying to make each other sink. It grieves me to talk about this, because in a boat situation when there is an elf and there is a dwarf in a training boat and the boat capsizes. Let us say that the blame was placed on the dwarf. He's a huge guy, man. He's three times the size of me and his weight was just like, he just needed to like a tiny little moment of the weight and it was, we were lost. But there might just have been an element of grim satisfaction in the dwarf's face when he heard of another boating accident which also involved the dwarf, the elf. I can't believe that John would say that was my fault. Did he really say it was my fault? He's unbelievable, man. I wasn't very good at the canoes, really. I mean, I could never sort of get that sense to put it over that way, to do a left and all that lot. And I just kept getting lost and having to be towed back in. And Orlando was quite good. He'd, he'd practised a lot more than I had. And he was like, sort of, you know very uh, graceful and uh, um but um so any time i could give his boat his canoe a little knock with my oar i would do you know so it's been sent around the wrong way <laughs> say action is i can't it's been he's put me he's put my boat in the wrong direction i love orly i mean i definitely i would pick on him a lot just because i could i had this thing i refused to drive when we were there because it was on the left side and i'm a little dyslexic <laughs> I was just terrified, so Orlando lived really close to me, and I would make him drive me around everywhere, <laughs> and we would spend a lot of time together, and I guess I wanted to watch over him, and, you know, it was his first movie, and um, that could really mess with some people's heads, going from being a student in film school to being one of the stars of, of such an enormous film. And, and so I, I always took a lot of notice of, of just what he was doing and how he, not how he was acting or anything, but in him, his, in his personal life. Orlando was uh, no more selfish than any of us, uh, but, but he wasn't always as clever at disguising it uh, as the rest of us, because he's not that experienced. So that if he wanted something, he sort of came out and asked for it. Wiser birds go round the corner and uh, whisper and sidle and to achieve the same effect. So sometimes the old lion had to push down the young cub, but not really, only in fun, because, because he, he's such an open guy and, and was, his enthusiasm was so shared by us all. He's a lively guy, and he's a, but he's a really good guy, got a good heart. And, uh, but we're very different in some ways. I'm from up north, he's from down south, and he, I call him a southern softy, and he calls me a northern bastard. <laughs> John Bean, he was a real uh, brother in arms, story-wise, um, but also actor to actor and man to man. He was a, a most valuable ally to me. We were doing the... Uh, the sort of scene where I die, and V goes, you know, laid over me. 
and, and talking to me. And we, we sort of did all my shots before lunch. And then we just said, like, they said, like, all right, that's lunch. We come back to the death scene later. <laughs> and and, uh, and then we came back after lunch and shot this, you know, all the, all the coverage on Vigo. So it was quite, it was quite strange that, because you still, you know, you just break off and have some potatoes and some food and stuff like that. And you go back for your death scene again and die again. Ian McKellen, when, it, when Ian arrived in New Zealand, I showed him um, a videotape I had with some interviews with Tolkien, and then obviously he got some of those audio tapes that you can get. And Ian based his performance of Gandalf on Tolkien. I mean, he was impersonating Tolkien. It was looking at myself in the mirror as Gandalf, uh, adjusting the stoop of the shoulders, and, and, and in doing that, uh, feeling the voice deepen and getting raspier and, and a little more precise than perhaps my own is. And really, in a sense, Tolkien does does have uh, you know he does have a a part in our movie um, interpreted through Ian McKellen's performance of Gandalf. Ian shared our trailer, so if you can imagine the four hobbits in a trailer with Ian McKellen. I, I was sort of partitioned off. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. Perhaps it was thought that Gandalf wouldn't want to talk to. Uh, lesser beings. There was an entrance at this end of the bus and an entrance at that end of the bus. And when Ian was in the chair, we always used the other entrance out of respect. But I was rather grateful of having a, a, a rather, albeit flimsy, partition because uh, Elijah Wood in particular, oh, and Dominic Monaghan uh, liked to play music quite loudly uh, early in the morning and it wasn't always music that was to my taste. So that became kind of difficult. <laughs> you know, you'd kind of hear him sort of Aah! in the back of the trailer. Ah! At one point, just in protesting and some sort of, you know, you can't really figure out what he's saying, but just protesting. But uh, the, these, these, uh, there was no tension because of it. He's a very amusing man, great sense of humor, and a very nice man. It's an awful phrase, really, to say that somebody's nice. But when I say nice, I mean, he's a very decent person. He's a very fine actor. And he was tremendously supportive, as far as I was concerned, encouraging and a constant companion, you might say. It's my first opportunity to play with um, Ian McKellen, whom I've met, but I've never actually worked. I mean, people automatically assume that, you know, you know everybody in Britain. But I, uh, we've never worked together. And that has been a, a tremendous joy for me, because he's the most generous of actors. And he works in a way that I like, which is a sort of ensemble way of thinking. In other words, you know, he's not afraid of suggesting things to me and vice versa. And uh, that way, you know, we can combine and work out a scene together. Ian is a master actor. Um, he has a technique or an approach to, to film acting, which uh, hadn't occurred to me before, in that each time uh, he spoke the lines, uh, it was a slightly different Bilbo that I, I was uh, working with and reacting to. Because Ian's approach is to willfully make each take different. Uh, and so he provided what he called a kaleidoscope of Bilbo uh, for Peter Jackson to eventually look through and uh, shake into whatever configuration he wanted. One of the great things about Christopher Lee is that he is a huge Tolkien fan. Um, probably one of the biggest Tolkien fans that I've ever met. He, he's read Lord of the Rings every year. He reads it once a year and has done so for decades. He, um, he actually met Professor Tolkien once. I never had to really talk to him about who and what Saruman was. He, he just absolutely knows his character um, inside out and said to me something very sweet, that it was fulfilling a, a lifelong ambition of his to be involved in a film a film of Lord of the Rings because he has been reading it for so long and waiting for the day that a film would be made and 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 dreaming that that he might possibly be involved in it. I think I've always rather underestimated Christopher Lee because of the films that he's made and he'd be the first to say that not all of them are of the highest quality. I certainly haven't seen them all. There's more than 200, isn't it? But I, I have always been impressed by uh, his physical and, and vocal uh, authority, and, and I think he's, he was very well cast. Me meeting Christopher Lee and, and watching him work on this character was, was a wonderful experience for me. I mean, I went on, uh, well, I didn't have days off, but I would run from my set to watch what he was doing sometimes. 
you know, having to come in and do Saruman and, and like go zero to 60 now, boom, it's, and you get a quarter mile and that's all you get and you better make us believe it. He knows so much about these stories, about, about this book and cares so much about it that he is like an emissary, you know, from, from the mists, like the ghost of Tolkien on the set. The famous phrase, Ash Nazgur Bartoluk, Ash Naz Grimpatul, Ash Naz Thrakataluk, Akbur Zemisi Kimpatul. One ring to rule them all. I think Liv Tyler said, this is just the, the weirdest set in the world because, you know, there, there's monsters walking around and, and wizards and also, you know, very small people and, and very tall people. And and, and it was a quite a, a weird thing at first, I suppose, but it became natural, you know, it was your place of work. I kind of feel bad for Liv because, you know, her her, her character was such that she wasn't required all the time and she would come to New Zealand for, for kind of stints. So she was sort of left out to a certain degree of the kind of camaraderie that we were able to gain and the experiences that we were able to gain as a fellowship because we were there for basically the entire length of time. She became our princess. She sort of, we looked out for her, you know, it was like, it was, it was a boys movie and she, she came in and sort of gave us that element, that that uh, that female touch and um, and it was great to have her around. Someone like Kate Blanchett or Liv Tyler would show up. It's a different quality, a different energy would come to the set, and it affected the way people behaved on the set and the way people acted. And it was wonderful working with Kate. The image that I most had in mind when I prepared for that scene is when I actually met Julie Christie, possibly the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And it was that impact um, that I really wanted to try and convey in this, in this scene with Gimli and, and the Enchantress herself. And it was very easy to do that with Kate, because Kate's got her own beauty and luminous quality herself. I was really looking forward to working with her, because apart from Lothlorien, I don't really have scenes with her, and that was a scene where we we got to speak Elvis together, and it felt really effortless because she was so involved in it and so fluent with the language that it, it just uh, it transports me when I see it, and it did at the time. Having actors like Kate Blanchett and Liv Tyler and Hugo Weaving are able and have the, have the power to portray non-humans ethereal, they have an elegance and a beauty Hugo is an actor very much like myself, and so we were both of us um, rather enjoyably uh, out of our normal milieu, and uh, a lot of our off-screen conversation was, was about being a theatre actor and plays that we'd done or wanted to do. A very congenial, like-minded uh, person who has a wonderful sense of humour, and uh, there's a lot of laughter around when, when Hugo's there. <laughs> Hugo just sort of assumed that role of Elrond with the greatest of ease, you know, I mean, it just, I mean, there was I putting all this kind of thing, legwork into creating the character, and I think he just breezed in and made him, you know, he had all the authority of Elrond. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them in the land of Mordor, where the shadows... We had these scale doubles on the movie that were uh, short people to represent the hobbits for the wide shots. It's Kieran's birthday, what was it, on Tuesday? Tuesday, On yeah. Tuesday, it was Kieran's birthday. Look at the, the chiseled, the etched, the years of experience found on Kieran's face. And later you'll be able to see him wearing all of our faces. Kieran was the, the lord of the scale doubles. The sergeant, you know, the ringleader, the... Uh, the disciplinarian, and he ran a very tight ship. Kieran, I hear they're going to set you on fire. How do you feel about that? If it happens, I'll be really happy to do it. And the person who, who doubled for me was a, a girl from Thailand called Fawn, who is just absolutely beautiful. We, we got on so well. She was talking about wanting to become a, a stunt woman because she loved all that stuff, except for horses. She hated being on the horse. This is the best double, right? This is perfect. It's pretty, pretty close. Yeah, really, really good. Yeah, yeah. It was a young 12-year-old uh, boy at the time, and I think they chose him because Martin had this kind of uh, twitchy, kind of nervous energy that I think Mary seemed to have at the start of the movie. He picked it up very quickly and, and you know, really 
put a lot into the movie in terms of his physicality. We had to have a very intimate relationship with these people. They had to become us in, in miniature form, you know. We had a double for, uh, for Gimli named Brett, who, who did all of Gimli's scale work and a lot of his stunt work as well. Uh, four foot nine and a half. Um, also, I'm a uh, black belt in the martial art. He already had some problems with his knees and he really injured himself badly, but just kept going. And uh, anytime you were tired, you know, all you had to do was look at him and what he was accomplishing. And he was definitely an inspiration. Sean Astin's uh, scale double, an Indian guy called BK, speaks with a very uh, strong Indian accent. Cannot talks like that. Hello, how are you doing today? Nice to see you. He loves red wine and loves chess. You like red wine? I've got red wine. Yes, man. Fantastic. And he would play. He's awesome at chess. So he'd be dressed as Sam with a mask of my face. So it was like uh, I was playing a miniature version of myself who was better than me at chess. Him and Sean would go at it. He'd kick Sean's ass every time. Sean fancied himself a chess player. He'd kick his ass. I take his bishop, and then he come and he tried to take my king, and I take his king, and they run around and laugh and stuff. Him and Vigo were an amazing team together. They were very funny, and they got on very well. Sandu Suraj na you can't see the sun and moon. It's very uh, interesting to see BK shouting at Vigo. You know, get in car, get in car, and Vigo go. Oh, it's very sorry, get in the car, and you know, it, it was like a mother hen kind of relationship. Brilliant. Uh, and this day we went fishing and um, he caught a fish and uh, ran in and, and said, oh, there's, a, there's a load of salmon and they're all feeding around the shore. So just throw your rod in and you should catch a fish in a couple of minutes. We went back that night and Vigo said, um, I'm going to cook the fish tonight. And I went into the uh, kitchen and BK screaming at him screaming orders, you know, open oven and cook rice and get colander and bring me knife and bring me fork. Vigo's running around going, okay, all right, all right. You know, getting in trouble. And we sit down and we've had to clean up his mess and, and prepare the fish. And we're complimenting him, and rightly so, on his excellent curry and, and, you know, and he's saying, I know, I know. Yes, it was quite good and like that. And then I said, what do you think of the fish? And he says, it's okay. You know, like, <laughs> and then I said, well, uh, you don't like it? And he says, it's not how I would have made it. And I said, well, how would you have made it? I would have made fish curry. <laughs> I said, well, of course. We lived you know, most of us, not together, but we lived in the same city for 15, 16 months, traveling together, late nights together, long hours together, um, cold weather, everything, all of these elements. And we were doing it together as a force. And in, in that way, the fellowship became a reality. And it just completely changed who I was as a person and where I was going, you know? and. Simply for that fact alone, it's been the most rewarding thing that's happened in my life. You get to, you know, see and touch and smell and feel the energy of, of at least 100 people, but more like 800 people over the course of 15 months in a way that, uh, you know, in most of human life, you don't have that kind of closeness with people. You know, people got crabby, there were bad days and stuff for everybody, and bad periods, but there was always a kind of a support system, you know? Mostly unspoken, it was just there. Lifelong friends, there's not one member of the fellowship that I, that I don't think I'll know for the rest of my life. Those friendships that are so important to the story as well um, were a reality, and a reality because of what we had to go through together. This is the biggest low-budget film being made anywhere in the world at this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's the biggest low-budget film being made in the in Wellington, the, uh, Wellington area. In the Wellington area. It's the biggest low-budget film being made in the history of the planet.
you know, even though we shot these three movies for 15 months, if, if, if we just had one unit shooting everything that needed to be shot, we'd be probably going for six or seven years. We had these uh, many units shooting, often five units shooting, sometimes seven units shooting. Almost always we sh shot with two cameras on each unit. It was fairly high speed. I mean, Peter is one of those classic sort of people that his capacity to absorb a lot of information, I find really amazing. So he's one of those sort of people that can work several shoots at once. 1A was the main unit and the other unit was called 1B. And then it became apparent that even those two units were not gonna get through this amount of footage. So we created a second unit which was directed by John Mahaffey. And eventually, as we went along, we realised that the, uh, the second unit were not going to get through everything that they needed to get through either, so we created a second second unit, which was directed by Jeff Murphy. Pete made it very clear that he couldn't be everywhere, uh, that he would like to be at every one time, but the people that were there in his place were ideal. They were the perfect people to be there, and Pete trusted them intrinsically, so we did the same. Our principal Hobbiton set was in um, a farm near the town of Matamata and we shot, you know, we shot a lot of the location footage there. We'd seen beautiful sets before, but this was unbelievable uh, because it was, it was there, it was real, it was ad as we'd have imagined it. You know, Bag End was there um, with the massive tree sticking out of the top, coming down, as we'd seen it in various paintings and images before. It was exactly how we'd imagined it. Hobbiton was an exceptional location, except that uh, it was extremely difficult to access. All the roads were really paths. Um, it was a very fragile landscape, and yet we basically still had to come in with fairly sizable technology. But it just required more physical labour to, to actually work the location. Today we're keeping the chimneys uh, up and running. There's uh, 47 chimneys in the location, which um, all have particular secret little ingredient smoke pots in them to keep them uh, up and running so it looks like there's a bit of, a little bit of activity uh, happening in the in the buildings so uh, and maha to you too as far, philosophically as far as what we wanted to do with Hobbiton since it was the opening of the film we basically wanted to start off with a sort of a very idyllic place which is very you know expressive as a, of a simple lifestyle a rural lifestyle where people are actually very much in touch with nature. And I just wanted to make everyone feel like that it was, that it was like a holiday destination. People would love to want to go there. When you're walking throughout the Shire, you could, you could see how, what an enviable existence it was for the hobbits. It's excellent. Everything is absolutely a joy to be here. It's, um, it's fun. It's something totally different. I think I would have paid money to be a hobbit. But uh, no, it's been great. Well, it's the uh, 17th of January, 2000. It's our first day back on the shoot since Christmas in the new century, and um, it was also Ian McKellen's first day today. You're late. A wizard is never late. Hugo Baggins. Nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. And it felt like coming home, and, and that... <laughs> It was a good feeling for, for, for me because Gandalf was uh, returning back to an uh, area of Middle Earth that he loved and respected. No, thank you. We don't want any visitors, well wishes, or distant relations. Yes, and what about very old friends? Of course, once Gandalf walks inside Bag End, then you're into a studio. You're no longer at Matter Matter. You're, you know, several hundred miles away, and you're in a, a small, confined studio. Often we filmed in two different scale sets. So Bag End was built, for example, in a large size scale for Ian Holm to appear in, and a small scale, the Hobbit size scale, for Ian McKellen to walk through. And in the smaller one, uh, I, as a normal sized person, could look um, enormous because everything in Bag End was, was small. The Bilbo's party, which takes place on the party field, we see the party field at Matamata in the daytime being prepared, 
but when you actually go to the party at night, you're now inside a studio. You're not in Matter Matter at all. You're in the middle of the day. It's t 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you've got a studio pretending to be a Hobbit party at night. It would be great to get, with the fireworks, it would be great to get more applause, you know? We're getting sort of, ah, oh, ah, oh, that, which, which is nice. It's certainly better. But if we've got a bit of, you know, if we've got a bit of jumping and actually cheer, cheering, or cheering and clapping at each, at each firework burst, it'll be good. It was great because they had all these um, extras as hobbits, you know, and this party scene was when they did that, um, the dance, and something that a lot of people might not have noticed is uh, I play in the band, the hobbit band. I'm up there with my hobbit ukulele, whatever it may be. Bilbo's going to tell a story, just, just like a story time. So we need you guys to be sitting on the mat, just like you do at story time. Everyone sees the butterflies, jump up and down, jump up and down. Everyone, 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 two, and three, and... I remember peak scenes was, this is the, the real time where you are hobbits, where you behave as hobbits. There's, there's no ulterior motive. You don't know about this mission yet. You're not worried about anything. You're just embracing who you are as young hobbits, you know. So we really just went to town at that point and had some fun. And I remember the day where uh, the, hot, the firework blows up in our face. As soon as it goes bang, you've just got to let it, let it go, OK? So how Peter said to us that when we're holding the firework, it will be lifted up by a piece of string and there'll be like a... Well, I didn't know. Whoosh! It was your idea. To uh, just kind of scare us and let, let the cameraman know when the, you know, the, t the cut is going to happen for the real explosion. Yes. But Billy, being this kind of slightly feminine character that he is, was really quite scared by it and made this girly kind of woo -hoo -hoo shriek, which I barely got through the take on. It's supposed to stick it in the ground. Where's in the ground? Outside. That's a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> Peter, I just like get such a fright, and Dom just gave me abuse for it all day. It's supposed to stick it in the ground. It is in the ground. Outside. This was your idea. You know, we've been shooting for about four months now, and we finally get to start to do things with the villains. Like we've done a lot of. Um, shooting with the hobbits and Aragorn and our heroes, and it's great to finally get the dark part of the story um, on film to start to set up the sort of the opposition, as it were. You put the pieces together and you're realising that yes, this is... Because I've been saying all the time to myself, and for his ring, it's time to know. Yeah, Ruins. Yeah. Almost to myself. Almost to yourself. Well, it's obviously a big thrill to work with someone like Christopher Lee, who's a bit of an um, icon, and, uh, I mean, I haven't mentioned it to him, at this stage, but um, I've been a big fan of his, obviously, most of my life, and watching um, Hammer Horror double features when I was a kid, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just sort of fun and a little bit unbelievable to finally be working with someone like that and having them on the set and directing them, and, you know, it's, it's a big thrill. Now, my first day in the garden, I remember we got to take ten, which is very unusual with me. I don't say that in an immodest way. I mean, there just isn't time in most films. Wait a minute, 10, 11, 12. Surely we got that right. But it was Peter who wanted that line up, that line down, that word, that way, and, it, and those words, that way, or whatever. He waited until he got it, and it took a lot of takes sometimes. Well, we got used to it and realized that was the way he worked. No problem. I remember saying to Ian, I'm getting a bit worried about this, you know, because I think we got to take 11 or 12 or something, and I think I got it right. Oh, he said, you don't have to worry about that. I had 24 takes the other day, and it was only a couple of lines. Why don't I say, just to complicate yes. it, say, say your line again. The nine have left me no small to gold. They have crossed the eyes and The nine? The nine? The interior of Orsank was, as far as I was concerned, papers, dust, and the sunlight coming through stained glass, a mess. And then leading out from that, uh, the more imposing dark inner sanctum with Simon's last chair, like a throne. 
uh, raised up above the, uh, the very shiny black surface of the, the floor. It was a place like no other. I, I, I'd never been in a, a room like that. It, it didn't remind me of anything. I, and, and I just thought, oh, I see, this is where Salomon thrives and plots. And uh, so that was a very evocative and helpful set. The costume was extremely long, and I had considerable difficulty in walking up the steps to my throne. Sometimes I managed to do it, sometimes I didn't. And one day I was driven to distraction when I kept on tripping. And I said, I'm sorry, I cannot get up these goddamn steps smoothly. I can't do it, Peter. I'm sorry, because every time I try, I step on the thing. And a voice came from near the camera saying, well, you did it this morning. It put me in my place. When did Saruman the wise abandon reason for madness? When I was dealing with uh, 1B, I was having to do the wizard fight. It was one of those deals where, you know, I was doing the stunt shots between Gandalf and Saruman. So you're gonna hit the ground and you hit the ground and it's like, ah, oh, oh, Jesus. The stunts were superbly well done. I had no idea what it was going to look like. I had no idea until I saw the film. Works very well, very well indeed. Second unit's first day was actually at night, and uh, it was the moment with the trees being ripped out at Isengard. That was the first thing they shot. And uh, we were kind of in and out of rain that whole weekend. <laughs> and that kind of became the mantra for second unit. It rained for about two weeks, and so this whole scene was shot in pouring rain in the middle of the night on beautiful gra green grass, which turned into about oh, eight inches of uh, slimy mud within an hour of, of starting. And it just added another dimension to the whole uh, the look of it, it just added a huge, wonderful, shininess, muddiness, grungy, sort of real element that, um, that no one could have, uh, could have imagined. Really. The very first day of photography, in actual fact, was a scene on the wooded road where the hobbits have to hide from the ring race. I, I thought you could turn, it, turn, it, turn around and say, quick! You know, yeah, yeah, just quick, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather than go to some remote place in the country to film this woodland, obviously there's many, many wonderful woods in, in New Zealand. Um, you know, there's actually a park in the middle middle of the city that is it's called Mount Victoria, and um, it's a wooded park land. It's only five minutes' drive from the studio, and we thought, well, you know, why travel down to the South Island, or you know, when we can actually just shoot this on on our doorstep. We're going into standby mode then, thank you ladies and gentlemen. Say one more time, all mobile phones had better be off or they'll end up in the ocean. And your radios, off if they're open please. No excuses. You know, Kara Cunningham for me, our first assistant director, uh, you know, she's one of those people that you can't imagine getting through the movies without. She has an, a great aesthetic understanding of what you're trying to achieve. So if it's sort of crunch time and she has a problem, you do everything in your power to help her out because all the rest of the time she's doing absolutely everything in her power to allow Peter and myself to perform our jobs to the maximum possibility. And set. And action! Get off the road! Quick! Quick! I knew what I was in for that day when Peter, you know, would bring the second or the third camera in and put it in close on us and say, okay, now it's the most terrifying thing you've ever experienced. It's just this primal fear and you're, and I want you to feel the fear. And he's talking us through this kind of idea of having our kind of spirit and souls and our whole essence yeah, disturbed by the presence of this black rider and realizing that, that you couldn't just think about that and you couldn't just feel it, that something was gonna have to happen that it registered for Peter and on screen. It was, a, it was an awesome acting challenge, awesome.
The town of Bree was one of the very first sets that we shot in, um, you know, in the, towards the end of our first week of shooting. I, I think we shot all of Bree, for the most part, the actual city street of Bree in one night. And we had the rain towers, and it was mad and crazy. It, it blew me away that they could they could take a very small piece of set and sort of build it into the earth and then film it and pan off of it and, and just trust that digitally the rest of the world would be created beyond that. The Prancing Pony was, like most of the sets, very authentic, really uh, well-crafted. It was a place where you step on the sound stage, you walk in that door to the Prancing Pony, and you're there. I mean, it was so well-constructed. And then we had these massive uh, tables uh, that we sat at. So it made us look small, like we were too small for the big tables. Uh, big mugs and, you know, uh, big plates. It made us feel smaller, and it kind of made that world more realistic for us. What's that? This, my friend, is a pint. It comes in paints. Oh. I'm getting one. It's really nice for the people involved in uh, the Midgewater Marshes uh, sequence to see it back in the DVD. I think it was important to feel that the, the journey from Bree to Rivendell was not an easy one. The Midgewaters were basically us along this journey with Strider trudging through these kind of marshy, nasty wetlands. It was freezing cold and our feet were so cold that you just couldn't feel anything. Meanwhile, you've got Pete Jackson like hiding underneath the little trailer, giggling, you know, because he's got his his four hobbits and, and uh, Aragorn going through this this uh, water that stinks and we're falling over and Billy fell flat on his back and it was a rough a rough day and I remember we all uh, went to the pub that night and were, were drinking uh, lots of kind of hearty drinks like whiskey and mulled wine and all that kind of stuff because it just chilled you to your bones, you know. The sword work on the movie was obviously incredibly important. Uh, the Weathertop fight was one of the, the early fights in the film. Weathertop was the main thing that we rehearsed before we started filming. You know, the actors arrived about six or eight weeks before the shoot. Um, having sword lessons with Bob Anderson was always part of their, their regime. We had so much fun learning how to do the sword fighting, and we actually choreographed a number of very involved sequences. And I remember when we were filming on Weathertop, I was bringing the full weight of my kind of anger and, and, and ferocity to it. And I remember Peter saying, well, listen, you know, you're a hobbit, and you, you couldn't actually generate that much force to, like, have your sword move the sword of the ring wraith if you were to strike it. So you got to kind of pull it back. And I remember feeling like, Man, no one's gonna see that. I'm really good at this sort of stuff. I'm gonna have to kind of, I gotta just be like a little hobbit doing it. The irony is that the the uh, the person that had to be the most accomplished swordsman in the film, which was Vigo Mortensen playing Aragorn, Vigo didn't get cast in the movie until we were uh, a few days into shooting the film. So he he didn't have any of the advantage of this training with Bob, and he'd never used a sword before. So so Vigo arrives in New Zealand, he gets off the plane, and the weather top fight scene is like the first thing he's going to shoot. So Bob Anderson was my first guide, basically. And he, you know, he was pretty strict, but really uh, encouraging. I think he gave Vigo the most the most um, crash course in sword fighting that anyone's ever had because Vigo had to be there fighting these ring race, fighting five ring race at the same time, looking like an expert swordsman. And, and I'll tell you what, you know, Vigo just became, I think, you know, the greatest swordsman that Bob has ever wor worked with in his entire career. We actually realized that bringing Arwen's voice down to a really low register 
how that suddenly just made everything work because it showed her depth and her age and her wisdom. Last of It was hard, I mean, just purely guttural, you know, kind of. <laughs> it sounded really weird at times when I was doing it. I thought, oh my God, this is too deep, but um, it worked. And it was funny when I, my dad saw the movie for the first time, he's like, whose voice was that? I was like, dad, you jerk. It's mine, I'm an actress. <laughs> right hard, don't look back. Natalie, Masvidal, Natalie. They must have hundreds of hours of footage of Jane riding, and she was incredible. As the truck gets a length ahead, so he's actually just got momentum on, then you could actually set yourself in. The action that we're doing is like, you know, like yesterday we were jumping over a log and then galloping down a steep hill. Um, another day, you know, you're galloping along, weaving through trees. Um, I, th I don't think it was ever a question. I was never going to be allowed on the stallion going at that speed. That was just never an option. I was on the back of a truck on a barrel with, um, you know, this kind of a horse skin wrapped around it, and I had to do this for five days <laughs> and look scared. And, uh, I mean, that was rough. The Rivendell location was primarily built at, um, at a park called Kaitoki. We chose it really because it had, you know, quite a, quite a closed-in geography, and um, so that the set that we built would have a sense of drifting off into the forest. So its boundaries were sort of forested, if you like. So I mean, the elves, that that whole concept of being one with the nature was pretty important and as a result Peter had the design team you know have this kind of indoor outdoor feel throughout so we would have outdoor sets um, you know for exterior shooting as well as sets outdoors for interior shooting and we um, mimic that on the stage as well where we would have you know interior sets of um, Rivendell that still had that outdoor feel so we'd have trees on the stage you know or we'd have like um, you know matte painting backdrops, you know, of rocks and whatnot in the distance. And But the thing is, I mean, in the end, you're still basically, what, I, what you do is you look at, you know, you just try and sort of remember the qualities of natural light that are in, in, is in the environment or the sort of qualities you want to achieve. And then you go into the studio and now you're basically trying to achieve those qualities, except that you have to do it artificially. The, uh, the reason we built Elrond's uh, council chamber inside was we had to be able to control the environment completely, so it wasn't something we could really shoot out at, out at Kaitoki. You know, we were literally sitting in a circle of, of, of actors like Ian McKellen, Hugo Weaving, Vigo, Morton Cern, Sean Bean, John Reese davies you know, Elijah was there, and, you know, it was, it was just like I was looking around, I was sitting there thinking, whoa, this is a real lineup of, of some greats. Sauron himself. Forged the wandering. Molten gold mixed with its own blood contains his life force. The Council of Elrond is, is a long scene in the book, much shorter in the film, uh, but it did take a long time to shoot. It, it dominates most of my memory because the council scene took about, my God, I think it took a, the better half of like five days. We spent a lot of time there because we had to sort of cover it from more or less every angle. Uh, you see all the characters all in a circle. So we had to shoot it from everybody's point of view. And so by the end, I mean, I, we, I think we all knew each other's lines because we'd heard them that many times. It was probably the longest sequence in the movie, um, which is kind of shocking, because I think that there are scenes that seem a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but just pure scenes, that was one of the longest. You shall be the Fellowship of the Ring. Right. Where are we going?
some of the locations were incredibly remote. We occasionally just flew people in in choppers, which was a fairly major operation. We usually had to have four or five helicopters making several trips to the location to get everybody up there. And there was always, um, you know, serious safety considerations because if you're stuck on these mountains and suddenly, you know, a storm sweeps in or clouds sweep in, the helicopters kind of can't land or fly. And there's a very big danger that everyone's going to get stranded and have to spend the night on this mountaintop or wherever you are. And so. We always, you know, used to take survival kits up there. We used to take tents and rations and stuff up there for the in case the situation arose that we would get stuck on a mountain for a day or two without being able to be rescued. It was, it was, so it was always a little bit tense. And uh, one of the most spectacular mountains was a place near Mount Aspiring where we did the scene in the snow where Boromir picks up the ring out of the snow and holds it, and uh, and that was shot in a very remote mountainside because I just wanted to be able to feel that we were really up the mountains and we weren't just cheating it on a ski field or, so or something somewhere. I think it took 10 or 15 minutes to get there and I remember we flew through cloud which freaked me out cause you couldn't see anything and I was normally fine in helicopters and I was always really excited to be in helicopters but it was actually quite turbulent the weather wasn't perfect. And all the other guys were great they were filming it and Dominic and uh, Billy and Orlando were saying, oh, man, this is amazing. And I was sort of gripping the seat, just thinking, when are we going to get there? I was worried when we got there, all Sean would be able to think about or would be fighting thinking about for the rest of the day was, I have to ride back, <laughs> you know? And I thought, man, it's a, it's a crucial scene, and he has a moment with the ring. It's a very... It's a very important moment for the fellowship. And he really did well. I thought that was one of his outstanding moments in the movie. It is a strange fate that we should suffer so much fear and doubt over so small a thing. Afterwards, I said, you know, when we were getting ready to go, and um, I said, were you, were you thinking about the, um, the fact that we would have to ride back again in the helicopter? You know, were you thinking about this all the time, the whole time? <laughs> I said, man, I don't know how you did it, but you really nailed it. After this particular journey, he didn't take any more helicopter rides. He just said, that's it. I'll walk, I'll swim, I'll crawl, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll walk all night to get there by morning, but I'm not taking any more helicopter rides. Shortly afterwards, we had to go to another location, which was, um, which was in the Remarkables in Queenstown by a, a lake to shoot a scene. Well, Sean absolutely did not want to fly and uh, said, look, I'll take the ski lift up and then I'll walk the rest of the way. We shot there for two or three days and our day would begin um, with our day would begin with everybody flying in in the helicopters and as we flew over at like, you know, 7.30 in the morning, we'd look down and there'd be this tiny black speck climbing the cliff. It was like it almost like a cliff face and it was Sean Bean dressed up as Boromir. <laughs> <laughs> like a human fly on the wall, clambering up this mountainside all by himself to sort of get to the um, to get to the location because he didn't want to go there and shop. He had like a, like two hours of climbing to do. And they used to see me from the helicopter, you know, and I was sweating at the end. It was like a real adventure getting over the, that sort of mountain to get to the set. But I did, you know, I, I preferred doing it that way. <laughs> The, uh, the scene of the Fellowship and the Avalanche was very difficult to shoot. I actually didn't shoot much of that. That was directed by John Mahaffey. It was shot in a stage with this fake snow. The uh, simulated snow is a rice-based um, product. To taste, it was kind of salty or something. It's like, it was kind of like, um, almost like uh, sawdust, salty side of sawdust or something. It was horrible. It gets into your eyes, it affects your eyes more than anything else. Even after one day of it, it left your face really red and raw, you know? I mean, it just really got your, in your eyes and your ears, your whole body. It was, it was a high salt content in it, whatever it was. You know, filmmaking is very counterintuitive. Um, when it's supposed to be freezing cold and snowing, you're invariably on a set where the Klieg lights are on and you're so hot that your sweat is pouring down your face. You had to keep saying to yourself, no, 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 I'm feeling very cold, I'm in the snow, uh, despite the 
warmth of the bright lights. However, uncomfortable is what it must be to be in an avalanche, and, and so in the end, it's probably an aid to believability. The exterior for Moria was shot on a wet set. It was shot in a car park right by a railway station, which is really funny when you think about it, because, you know, it looks so convincing as the outside of a lake. But that was good. It was worth doing one more. We will do one more. That was very nice. Thank you, broom people. Hey, Orlando. Yeah. Just be careful turning, because it looks a little like if you're turning that far, you'd probably see it. OK. Being an elf and everything, so probably don't turn quite so much. It was freezing. The nights that we had to do the exterior stuff there, it was some of the coldest nights I can remember. Um, I remember, actually, Billy Boyd, I think, was probably the coldest of us all. That evening is the coldest my feet have ever been, to the point that I was almost going to have to say it. I, I can't actually go on. It was, like, 4 or 5 in the morning, and we'd done this shot quite a few times, and I was, I, I, I was becoming really, really uncomfortable. So that's my my abiding memory of uh, outside the gates of Moria. We must face the long dark of Moria. When I was walking with the, the, the staff in the mines of Moria, which had to have an uh, uh, illuminated bulb on top, that, that had to be provided with an electricity, and, and it, it, it traveled along the wire through a hollow staff out through the bottom, uh, and, and the wire was hidden under the robes into a, a battery pack attached to my back. I don't think you were sort of holding it in any particularly, well, I think you were just using it, you know, just as a, as a torch, basically, yeah. Brian Bansgrove was our uh, chief lighting technician or, uh, or gaffer. DPs like to have a great relationship with their chief lighting technicians or gaffers. And because um, sometimes, you know, it can get a bit lonely out there. There's not a lot of people that really sort of understand the, the finer intricacies of light. I basically really appreciated Brian for his eye. It's great when you've got a gaffer on set who actually understands the emotion of what you're trying to do with, with the light that you've got. And when you do a film that's visually effects laden and you're dealing with CG characters, you often have to act to someone that might not even be there. If you're, if you're acting with a cave troll, for example, well, there is no cave troll. As an actor, you just had to believe that they were going to create something spectacular that you were fighting. Peter showed us things, uh, CGI stuff, you know, which gives an idea of what we were fighting, even though, though it was thin air, we, we knew what it would probably look like in the end. Uh, and once you get into the rhythm of that, that's fine, you know, you can sort of deal with it, and it's, it's just, it just becomes very natural. We'd already faced so many different situations together as a group that it was all right. And there was just a lot more that was invisible and therefore a lot more make-believe involved in that, shooting that sequence. And then when you see it all put together, it's fantastic because it all makes sense. You know, someone's, sometimes somebody's telling you to do something and it seems really weird and it seems wrong and it seems, but this is crazy. But you said, trust, you know, trust it, it's going to look good. And it, it did, you know. Well, the one thing that uh, you're not going to be able to tell at the moment is that we're in this warehouse next to Wellington Airport and it's incredibly hot and humid and there's no air conditioning in the building and we've got um, huge amounts of light and it's really giving this place a, a very subtropical um, jungle sort of feel. It's freezing in here, Pete. You want a jumper? Yeah, I'm going to get my big woolly jacket and my gloves and my balaclava. <laughs> um, I wanted to do something special for Galadriel. I felt that of all the people in the story, she was in a way more connected with a, you know, a spiritual world. And I took my biggest cue off out of the, the writing of Tolkien, which basically described her as saying, no sign of age was upon her except in the depths of her eyes, keen lances in the starlight, wells of deep memory. I wanted to find a visual interpretation for that somehow. So what I, what we did, Brian and I did a few little experiments, and we eventually came up with what we called the Galadrolite. We went out and bought many Christmas lights, and we festooned them all over this rig. And what it did is it actually reflects like Starfield in her eyes. Because, you know, to me, it's like a lot of performances in the eyes, and I wanted her highlights to be different to everybody else's in the film. The scene where the Fellowship depart Lorien and receive their gifts 
had to be shot on the sort of edge of a, of a pretty riverbank. And um, instead of finding a river, we actually found a, basically a, a lake, a small lake in a country estate called Fernside. We are um, just basically pumping a lot of smoke and using the sun and trying to get, you know, god rays and things to make it a f feel a little bit ethereal, elven, dreamlike, Lothlorien. I had a lot of fun there in that location. They had this huge trunk with, like, you know, huge um, roots going off into the water as if they were almost like little um, docking areas, these huge roots going into the water. So, yeah, that was uh, a beautiful location, actually. There was a dreamlike quality to that whole place uh, with all of the kind of fog that we put through there um, and the fact that we as the Fellowship were kind of together in this sequence as well. Thank you, my lady. Well, have you run out of those nice shiny daggers? Um, we shot that scene over several days, which I'm really glad has gone back into the extended cut now, because it's, it's, it's quite a nice scene. It's sort of essential to the story, because the Fellowship are given these gifts which they use in, in subsequent movies. Um, so I'm glad that we're actually able to let people see that scene now, because it sort of sets things up for the next two films. Technically, the scene was difficult because when you read about it in the book, it's, it's, it's quite enchanting. You, uh, you know, Gimli says, yes, there is one thing I would have. I would have one hair from your, from your head. And she gives him three. Now, on the page, that works. But think about it in terms of film. There's the dwarf with his great big gloves on. And there's this elegant, wonderful woman and what's she going to be doing? She's going to be doing, um, all right, then you want a hair sort of thing. Um, she... Oh, damn. Well, um, there it is. Can you see the hair? There is actually a hair in my hand. All right? Now, she's got to fish out three anyway. All right, so, so now, now, what does she do? She gives this hair to me. What do I do with it? I mean, do I, I, I mean, how do I, how do I take it? I mean, do I... I've got, do I put it in the glove like that and say, oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it is, it is just too cumbersome to film. What was her gift? I asked her for one hair from her golden head. She gave me three. Some of the rivers that we were shooting on in the South Island, you know, they were picked for their beauty, um, but they were fast flowing and they were very deep. There were currents, and uh, so one of the training regimes that we set up for our, our actors when they first arrived in New Zealand was was boat handling skills, you know, basic like canoe type skills. And I know they had uh, a lot of fun, um, sort of, sort of. I think that most of their training. Uh, which was done off a wharf in the harbour, was revolved around trying to make each other sink. But it did ultimately come in very handy because usually it wasn't doubles in these boats, it was usually the actors themselves. We only had one mishap um, that I was aware of, which was shooting the scene where the actors are looking up at the Argonath. And that was a very deep, swift flowing river. And um, Orlando Bloom was paddling his canoe, and he had a small Gimli. It wasn't John Rhys Davies, it was um, Brett, who was sort of a, sm a small Gimli, double dwarf size. Myself and Brett were in this boat, and one of the guys filming grabbed the front of our boat and stopped us because we were going on downstream, and he just stopped us to catch us. But the water was running so fast that when he held onto the boat, it just started to come over the top of the boat and into the boat. And so we just started, we just started going down. Really, and I was going, let go of the boat, let go, man, because you know, he was holding onto it, trying to help us. And these guys went under the water, the boat sunk, and, 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 and all the we had lots of safety boats, they rushed in. And Brett Beatty was in, I mean, it's kind of funny, except that Brett was in this, like, armour. Like, he's in heavy armor, man. That's chainmail that he was wearing, and he's got this wetsuit on, but... And he had, like, a... He had, like, a blow-up, um... thing underneath him, a blow-up, um... life jacket in case, and he pulled that, and it didn't really inflate. I could see him going down, so I just went, like... I was holding on to this guy, and I just yanked him up out of the water, and he was like... This, and I was holding him up like this, and he was, like, going... Like, he was freaked out, man, and we chucked him up, and he was OK, but it was, like... For a minute there, man. I mean, that could have been bad. I think Orlando was more embarrassed than anything to be the one member of the fellowship who kind of sunk his boat whilst on active duty.
And those boats, as beautiful as they are, were, are, were pretty, you know, pretty tippy. They were kind of flimsy in a way. And because of the scale issue, it was uh, Kieran Shaw, you know, uh, was, was Frodo. And I remember that the, when we did the wide shot, we were really moving down that river. And Kieran, <laughs> we were doing the first take, and Kieran's going, We don't, don't worry about me. And I'm like, I'm like, what do you mean? I'm trying to talk without moving my lips, you know, because <laughs> and he goes, well, if we flip over, I said, we're not going to flip over. And he goes, if we flip over, just save yourself. I can't swim. <laughs> I said, what? You know, you know, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> then I got really nervous. You know, like if someone's watching, you're driving, you start overcoming. And I was like, every Eddie now became fraught with, you know, possibility. And after that take, I said, you're kidding, right? And he goes, no, I'm even afraid to take a bath. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Towards the end of 1999, and like two or three months after we started shooting, we, we, we ended up filming our first really big battle scenes, I guess, of the trilogy. And they were the um, Ammon Hen fights at the climax of the Fellowship. This is a fight routine that happens on top of this hill, and you guys are charged up the brow of the hill, and you're flooding over here. And um, Aragorn, Aragorn here, Vigo, um, gets to fight you single-handedly. Um, one, one versus a hundred. You're killing machines. Move forward with the intention that you're going to kill. So keep it fluid, not stilted. Give it the best you can. Thank you. Richard made this impassioned speech, uh, you know, for the sake of authenticity, this and that. And, but it was about being, about bloodlust, about don't be afraid to maim and just, I mean, you, you know, he was trying to do justice to Tolkien's vision, you know, and so he was just, there is no mercy, there is no, and these guys, you could see them shaking with anticipation, and I was just, I looked over at Pete, and then I looked over at the stunt coordinator, who was just going like that, who was feeling the same as I, which was, these guys didn't need any more. <laughs> you know, encouragement to, like, you know, beat the snot out of me. <laughs> I was like, I, I just, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be ashamed if I have to just turn around and run my ass off down the hill. It's no problem. <laughs> you know, I got a long shoot ahead of me. <laughs> Amazingly hot. It was like you know over 100 degrees, and these poor guys were, were wearing this um, you know all this leather and fiberglass costumes with rubber masks. Warm in there. Very warm in there. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Coming. <laughs> The great rules of karate are if you cannot stand, you cannot fight. If you cannot see, you cannot fight. If you cannot breathe, you cannot fight. Sure enough, there I am, my helmet over my eyes like that. And in truth, very, very hard to fight. I think I have to say that 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 Lurtz, who is a, a general of the Urukai army, is potentially my my favourite character. He's played by a, an actor called Lawrence Mohore, an imposing gentleman, even when he's not in his prosthetics. Strike a pose and let's get with it. Oh. No! Okay. 
Uh, Barry Osborne directed most of the fight between Aragorn and Lurtz. When you're running into that next shot, you really take off. And action, Vigo. On this movie, I have so much to do that it takes actually quite a lot of effort to be able to do this. Um, and I find myself conflicted. But right now, finishing the movie seems to me to be the most important thing, and helping Peter out in that fashion is appropriate on this film. Okay. Oh, well, it looks fine. Are you going to be okay, okay with lights and stuff? Have you got, got some lights up there? Are you going to pull, pull, pull tie it off? And then... Blasting in there. Okay, well, you better shoot it fast then before it yeah, yeah. gets too shaky. Um, well, I don't think, we don't want to lock it off. Lock it off it's just so we have to keep them humid. We have to keep them feeling happy and good. So we just give him a camera and a crew, and he's as happy as Larry. He stays off our backs. It's a brilliant scheme. <laughs> right, Barry? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Now, now Barry's got a motivation. Now you see, you won't. So come towards us, Barry, and raise your thought. That's it. There you like go. that. Any time you make a movie with the sort of physical action you know, that we have, there's always a danger of people getting hurt. I mean, you obviously take every possible precaution that you can, but, um, you know, with that, pe people do get hurt. Fortunately, on the film, we never had any particularly serious injuries, not really serious, although one of the worst ones actually happened to Sean Astin. And it was a relatively simple shot where Sean ha had to be on the shore of the lake and he had to run out to the boat. I, I'm running at a dead at a dead sprint, and I get in, and my left foot and the and as my right foot lands about two feet in the water, just this huge sharp pain, and I grabbed onto the side of the boat and I just looked down, and I just it hurt so bad. Let's sit down and have a look at his feet, Mikey. Where are you? Let's sit him down and have a look at his foot. You want to sit on the beach or you want to sit on the chair? Uh, his sure. foot had virtually been been completely impaled on, on, on this uh, shard of glass. When they took the, uh, the prosthetic off, it was a big, old, deep gash in the foot. I mean, it was a substantial cut. Oh my God! It's a lot of blood, man. So Mike will get a. Um, it's a lot of blood. Probably gonna need a bit. There was this sort of globular um, thing that this mass that came out of his the slit in his foot uh, that I was fascinated with. Master Frodo can play with my clots anytime he wants to. Fascinated by his blood clot. We were a good hour, an hour and a half's drive out of Tiana. It was a long way, it was quite remote. We called for a chopper to come in because we knew we needed to get him to a hospital very, very quickly because there was a lot of bleeding. So the helicopter guy came out and we jumped in and it was Jacques Cousteau's pilot. The guy who had flown Jacques Cousteau around on some of his expeditions, which I thought was really cool. You know, it's a magic project because it made everyone so passionate, but like when I walk away from it, it's not, it's not only the creation of the film, it's the people who created it is what is the experience that I love. There was an awful lot of love involved uh, in, in making this film and it spread out from Peter Jackson who was typical of his um, other Kiwis. Dedication and, and love are all mixed together. It was made with love, it was made with, with, with great care and commitment and I do genuinely think that that spirit has made its way onto the screen. And that, 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 that in a way, to me, is, is, is what the real heart of the Fellowship of the Ring is. It's, it's, it goes beyond the heart of Tolkien's book and, 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 and something of this incredible spirit that was used making it has made its way on, onto the finished film. I'm kind of glad on this movie that I got to direct it and I didn't have to play a hobbit because, you know, those guys had, had a fairly arduous time of it. They had to get up at the uh, at some unearthly hour. How, how lucky are we to be in New Zealand to see this? 
That's half of why this movie is so amazing. This kind of stuff, every day. <laughs> My day would start within the five o'clock hour, uh, every day, it, for the most part. It's sometimes 4.30, that was lovely. The Hobbits would always start early because we had the prosthetics in the morning. Uh, our makeup took mostly about two hours. Glue was painted to the bottom of your feet. Then you would slide into these prosthetic feet. They would then hair dry uh, glue around the seams of your feet and paint them with the airbrushes and paintbrushes. Standing up at five in the morning and the whole time we're begging to sit down, but they don't let us. <laughs> they, they couldn't sit and have their feet glued on because the way that their ankles would sort of be bent in the wrong position. So they had to literally just stand up when I'm sure they'd rather be in bed. We have to be really honest and say that when the days that we don't have feet, we're really excited. Because <laughs> A, that means we have a later call, and B, we don't have to stand up for an hour and a half. I don't think my wife knows as much about my feet as Sean Foote. And isn't that ironic that Sean's last name is Foote? F O O. T E Sean Foot. O E? No E. No E. No I e. want to put an E on there because it's just too <laughs> weird that your last name is Foot and that you work on my foot. My foots. No E. So the the prosthetics would be put on. And that would be an interesting time in the morning. It was always kind of um it was our it was our time to be with each other. We went through phases as well. There were there was the kind of reading phase where we'd all be reading and we wouldn't talk. And then other times we'd be really into music and the, the, the CD would be blaring and everything would be up, you know, just different kind of moods that everybody went through. Every morning I bring a book about this big. I pick about three CDs to listen to because I'm here for so bloody long. And then we'd go on to the makeup chair, get our wig and our ears put on. So the, uh, the Hobbit ears actually encompass the entire ear and kind of fit on like, um, well, like a glove. Um, like an earmuff. Like an earmuff but it completely contoured for the ear. The thing that's weird about the ears is, in terms of acting, is uh, they're foam, latex, and so they actually absorb sound. And when other characters, when other actors are, are performing, and sometimes it's hard to, hard to hear them. And then, you know, maybe we'd get our, uh, our rewrites, because often, literally every day, the, the script was being rewritten. So anything that we'd learned the previous night made no sense because we would have revised script pages. I would say probably 90% of the, of the time we arrived on set. Not because we were in trouble in any sense, but it was really to get as close to Tolkien as possible, and I think we were always trying to incorporate more of Tolkien into the movie. I actually have a whole miniaturized script so that if I want to see like where we've come from or where we're going to, and we have other notes and stuff, but it's really neat just to be able to have something to walk around in and when Peter's talking about stuff and, and you can kind of, I don't know, it's just a useful tool. If there was time, we'd nip and get some breakfast. Sometimes there wouldn't be time, there'd be a rush on, so we'd, we'd get breakfast wrong to you. I'd normally have porridge. In fact, I don't think there was porridge on set until I kind of asked for it, and then there was always a big thing of porridge. So I think I kept everyone healthy on set because of that. The day has now begun. I'm, I'm now tr completely transformed into a hobbit. All that I have left is to put on my wardrobe. So I've got my feet. Got my wig, got my ears, got my dirt, I'm ready to go. I think I'll go in, in my trailer now, listen to a little music, relax, and get ready for the scene. If you ever actually made it to set, that's the thing about making movies, is, it is such a cliche, but it's so true. Everybody rushes because you have to be there in front of the camera when it's ready to go. But if something goes wrong, you know, a light goes or, or you need to reset something, then it could be another five hours. As we were filming the movie, there was a making of that was always going on, so there was normally a camera on set. And, you know, if we were ever really bored, been hanging around to do a shot for a while, we'd try <laughs> to do a little skit. The phone rang last night, and there was someone on the other, on the other, uh, the other end. <laughs> <laughs> it is that thing where. Uh, you get so used to each other's company and so um, comfortable with each other that some of the things that you're getting up to to keep yourself entertained just start to become a little bit uh, off-center. So this, uh, this Elijah guy, you know this Elijah Wood guy? Yeah. Have you spoken to him? Yeah, a couple of times. 
I was speaking to him today and he's just been a real idiot. Hey, hey. How are you? Sit down, hey, man. How are you? Hey, good, good. Probably seems cool. Oh, I do good. Hey, I've got a present for you. I've got a present for you. A present? Yeah. What for? Oh, just for Yeah. Nothing. Yeah? Just something I picked up. Oh, you deserve one, man. Oh, that's cool. You guys are I'm going to go and get it up. All right. See ya. <laughs> he is a f***ing <laughs> Next time, I'm going to punch him right in the <laughs> <laughs> I already did that to him the other day, man. Yeah? Oh, yeah. He is. He awesome. was, and he was and he f***ing cried as well. He's like, hey, mate. Hey. 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 What's going on? Cut an apple. <laughs> hey. Well, Woo! Hey, you guys. I've never met friends like you before on a set. Ah, uh, shut up. No, well, honestly, I mean it. No, I, I, I would agree with that as well. About my apple? Never been so close to no. two people in my life. Yeah. You know about my apple? Who is that? Are you an extra? I have no idea. He's, some, he's jabbering all the time. I sat down talking to you, trying to run my lines. Right. Jabba, jabba, jabba. Yeah, I'm constantly like, trying to interrupt. And I'm busy with it. Hey! hey boy. What's going on? Billy uh, boy! Hey, how are you? Hey! All right. <laughs> Billy boy! So we need to get back up in a minute or two, I think. Oh, are we going back yeah, up? Yeah, I think so. I can't wait to do this scene with you. Yeah, we'll have fun, eh? You're just so good. No, I think that's us. All right, come on. I remember once, me and Dom were, were doing this thing. Just bored, you know, we're out in location. And he says, how fast do you think you could touch every table in this <laughs> canteen? It's just me and him. I was like, I reckon I could do it faster than you anyway. The game that Billy played more than anything was to watch me run around and touch the tables and then to forget to have started the stopwatch and just watch me get more tired, you know. And the time is going longer and longer and uh, just laughing and giggling to himself. And then I go to do it. And as I'm running around, my foot comes off, you know, and flies off. Oh, I I'm not going to hell wetter that my foot's come off. And just at that, they say, OK, you're needed on set. And I've got this foot, you know, it's going to take like half an hour to put on. You just feel like an idiot. Of course, the biggest crime I could commit as a director was to, to have their feet glued on, but then because of the angles I was shooting that day to somehow not see the feet. Sean Aston in particular kept a running tally, and, and, and by the time he was finished a, a 274-day shoot, he could tell me exactly how many days he'd had his feet glued on and they weren't photographed. 50 separate days, we got to 50, that we had the feet applied when they weren't actually even seen on camera. In terms of the actual work itself, Peter would wait until we were all sort of present and, and he'd um, sort of talk us through things. And then we'll, um, then it's down and then Billy says, oh look, look uh, Mary, it's, it's Frodo. Hobbits are, are small, they're, they're, they tend to be about four feet tall. Uh, three foot six is kind of the average height of a hobbit. Obviously, we're not that size, so there was an interesting logistical issue with making us that size. And it wasn't one trick. There were a variety of things that we did to accomplish that, that final goal of the size difference between the hobbits and the rest of the characters. We had scale doubles, for one, and we, as the hobbits, had to direct them, which is interesting. So come up, run, and then just sort of, you know, and plant, maybe plant your front foot out there and just sort of settle yourself down with, with that as, as a bit of a, you know. The, the little tiny details that made up a, a kind of a simple performance for us, we had to kind of work them out with the scale doubles. And that was required of us pretty much every day. Brilliant. Thank you, Karen. The most complicated things were... Uh, probably false perspective, whereby if I were to be doing a scene with Ian McKellen, he would be in the foreground of the shot so that he would just look bigger, you know, because he'd be closer to the lens, and I would be back from the shot, but it, we would make out that we were level with each other. Amazingly simple in the sense that it is literally just one person in the foreground, one person in the back. Elijah will be, we'll look at the eyes. Elijah will be roughly, roughly down, down here. He's not directly opposite you. He's a bit lower, a bit further down the uh, But also logistically for us as actors, that posed the problem of Ilan. From the hand of uh, Saren himself. No, don't look at me. Saren himself. Because we couldn't look at each other during the two shots, which is a weird thing because you rely so much on the other actor's eyes when you're acting. It's important to have that connection, and we didn't have that connection for those kind of shots. And then there was also blue screen. Here we go, and action. 
and that was incredibly complicated and I was really nervous because I was like ah this feels really weird I'm, I'm walking on you know a blue mat and there's blue around me and there's no reference at all uh, to remind me of the place that I'm supposed to be. Does that look all right? Yeah, you, you, can, you can use a little bit of whip, whip down, down here. Down here. Watch you down the stick. Watch you down the stick. Um, there's a scene with Gandalf and Frodo in Bag End when Frodo gets up from the table and says, you know, we'll hide the ring and we can, no one will ever find it. And suddenly I had to kind of remember my marks, hit a mark at a, a specific place at a specific time so that it matched the timing of the shot that they got with Ian. No one knows it's here, do they? Do they, Gandalf? Probably the most frustrating thing for me was um, working on my knees. This is probably, I mean, the configuration with, with Billy and Dom is not quite right because Frodo had a clear access through. Just the freedom of movement that you have from having your legs you know, positioned on the ground is, is a lot freer than having your knees because there's a sense of overbalancing or underbalancing, falling one way or the other. <laughs> and so you've got all of these kind of different technical and, and logistic and cinematic tricks going on in your head, but at a certain point, you have to just kind of squeeze that out of your mind and remember what the story is and remember what your character is and, and, um, and have a profound emotional interaction with your imagination on camera. I think I'm getting the hang of this. We'd wrap generally at about 8 o'clock. Birthday boys are going to Alcove tonight, so if anyone wants to join where's, us. Where's it? What town is it? It's in Hamilton. Hamilton. Yep. The drinks on the line, yeah! yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I hope to see people there. That would be lovely. Uh, we had to take off our costume, then go into makeup and have our ears taken off and our wigs, which took about 40 minutes, and then have our feet taken off, which took close to about an hour, you know, in kind of soapy water with people hacking away at your feet with brushes and metal sticks and pipe cleaners and toothpicks and all that kind of stuff. Once the feet were off, if it was a Friday, we might have a beer as well. Nice. You sit there with a beer, somebody rubbing your feet. Come on, does it get any better? I don't think so. That's a typical day in the life of a Harvard lawyer. Right? <laughs>